Great. Let's see, first I, I have a, an announcement. Can you go down to the pad? And um, I'll just tell you about this. It's 3 p.m. and it's Terman 156. So here's the, uh, the announcement is, is next, when, next Wednesday, I won't be here. And I'm, I'm actually gonna, to the miracle of modern 1969 technology, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tape ahead next Wednesday's class today at three o'clock. So if you wanna come, it's, it's actually kinda, it'd be kinda weird because I'm gonna have to estimate what I'm gonna do Monday when I will be here. This isn't making any sense, is it? Um, but anyway, if you, if you wanted to like come to next Wednesday's lecture this afternoon, you're more than welcome. Um, actually, the reason, so if you, I don't know, if you're just like perverse or something and want to see what it would be like to see Wednesday's lecture before Monday's lecture, you could come in the afternoon. I, I mean, I can't really ask you to because it's out of order, but the TAs have to. And they're going to bring their, they're going to bring friends and things, people they find on the street. The reason is it's, it's too weird to give a lecture with no one to no one. It's, anyway, you get the idea. So I thought I'd just mention it. It's today. It's this afternoon. Oh, come on. Don't you want to, if you came this afternoon, then you could actually say that, that you'd, you'd go into some lectures out of order. Wouldn't you like to see Wednesday's lecture before Monday's lecture? Probably not. You could, then, but later, then you could tell everybody you know that you did this. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, then it's shown on Wednesday at, at 9. Yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, that's en en enough on that. Um, you're certainly under no obligation to go, but. What? I'll anticipate questions, yeah. I, well, I'll, I'll start by asking any questions from last time. Right. <laughs> Which won't have happened yet, so <laughs> naturally there won't be any. Yeah. I mean, unless, well, if you come, if you come this afternoon and can anticipate questions you might have, or confu actually, better yet, if you could look at the lecture notes and predict things that you'd be confused about on Monday, you could ask questions about that. Yeah. Or you could raise your hand and say, I didn't like the way you explained this on Monday. Can you go over that again? No. It could be fun. Anyway, I have to be there. But you don't. So. OK. Um, back to uh, feedback. Um, last time we concentrated on something, a, a very simple property, which is the fact that um, by applying, by, with a large loop gain, you end up with a, a system which is, with the closed loop gain, being very insensitive to uh, open loop gain. So this is what we, we found. And this is actually an extremely important point. Um, it's, the, it's the key to making a whole lot of things work. Uh, this was the case in the 20s, and it's, the, it's absolutely still the case now. So, um, and it's a very, very basic engineering uh, idea. Um, now, there's several other uh, things about feedback which we're going to look into now. The next, and again, also extremely important, is, is the effect of feedback on linearity. And so we'll, we'll look at that now. So, in the simplest case, we're going to look at the case where the um, where in this feedback system everything is still static. That means we don't even have a notion of time. There's no time. It's completely static, um, and the feed forward system or open loop system is nonlinear. So it's given just by some graph that plots the it's, its input output curve, sometimes called the input output. Uh, characteristic or the nonlinear transfer characteristic or something like that. This is extremely typical, by the way. This is typical of just uh, all electronic amplifiers. It's typical of lots and lots of things. <coughs> Looks like that. Okay. It's typical also of electromechanical systems. Look exactly like this. For example, this this will show you something like the this will show you how uh, in a DC motor the current and the torque are related. Looks exactly like this. Okay. So. Very, very common characteristic. Now, if, if, the sig if the input signal is limited to this range, it's pretty linear. It's, it's pretty linear. But as you go wider, it becomes nonlinear. So this is the situation. And this feedback system is now described by y equals a of e. a is a function now. That's the important part. And e equals u minus fy. This is now a set of coupled nonlinear equations. a is not a number. If it were a number, I could just take high school algebra here and eliminate e to get to express y as a function of u. We did that last time. 
Now, this is some function, and there's no way we can, in general, in fact, there is no analytical formula for this. Okay, absolutely none, especially for the A's that you'll actually encounter in practice. The A's you encounter in practice, by the way, are things like hyperbolic tangents and things like that. You'll see this in 113 and other, other, uh, other exciting places like that. Um, so here, this is just a set of coupled nonlinear equations. Actually, uh, there's, in generally speaking, there is no formula that gives you Y in terms of U. On the other hand, it is quite common that for any u, there's a unique y that solves this equation. And so it does implicitly define a, uh, define a, um, a, a function, a closed, a, a closed loop transfer characteristic. So here's an example. Um, how I actually solve the equations, I'll sh you'll soon see. And in fact, I guess on your next homework, you'll actually soon do. Um, but here it is. Here's an open loop characteristic like this. That's, I, think it's, I think I just, that's actually literally the characteristic of a, uh, Moss differential pair amplifier. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's slightly nonlinear. It says that, that the output voltage of that amplifier is a nonlinear function of the input voltage. For small swings in input voltage, like plus minus 40 millivolts or something like that, um, it's, the output's quite linear. And it would be characterized by the gain, which is the slope of this, this, this thing. Okay? So that's the uh, open loop characteristic with a feedback gain of 0.2. Solve for the closed loop characteristic. This one, by the way, there's no formula of any kind for this. No form, you cannot solve, there's no formula. This is not, you know, our hyperbolic tan, H, you know, of, of anything. This is just, we were able to compute it numerically. And it looks like this. And when you look at these two, you see something pretty stunning and pretty obvious. It, it's obvious just to the eye. And what's obvious about it is that the closed loop characteristic is a lot more linear than the, than the open loop characteristic. Um, in fact, the truth is here, I had to really back off on the amount of feedback to apply. Because if you apply any realistic amount of feedback, what this curve looks like is it's absolutely a straight line. So I had to really back off on the amount of feedback to apply to get a visual effect where it's clear it's still nonlinear, but much more linear. So, um, and so, I mean, the observation is, and also if you check the axes here, um, these look like they're on the same axis. They're not. That's 0 0.05 and that's 0 0.2. So the gain is basically four times lower here. So the observations for this example are that the gain is lower. Now the gain, of course, you can't talk about the gain of a nonlinear system, but sure you can. It's sort of the slope at, uh, around the origin. That's the gain. That's a good measure for the gain. Um, it's lower, but the characteristic is, uh, is more linear. And it turns out that these things just work in general. And let's see how that works. Um, here is, I'm going to define G of U um, as, a, as a, I'll say Y is G of U. G is this function where, in fact, there's generally no formula for G. Even if there's a formula for, um, for A, for example, which there often is, there's generally no formula at all for G. It's just defined implicitly. So I'll define G, and then I'll just differentiate this equation with respect to uh, U, which I can do. And E, of course, also is a function of U. And I just do some implicit differentiation. I get G prime of U is A prime of E times the E du. And I differentiate this equation again with respect to U. And I get this equation here. Derivative of U is 1 and so on. And now these, actually, if you stare at them, you'll realize these are pretty much the equations we've been looking at before because now they're numbers. That makes perfect sense because what does differentiation do? I mean, it's not unlike the Laplace transform. Laplace transform turns differentiation into multiplication and convolution into multiplication. If you ever thought about it, what differentiation does is it turns nonlinearities, it turns nonlinear systems into linear systems. Now, how does it turn it into it? Well, it's an approximation. So it's not really exact. But that, if you have, I mean, that's one way to think about what, what calculus means. It takes a nonlinear characteristic or system and converts it into an approximation, which is linear. So what's the point of that? The point of that is that once things are linear, there's a whole lot more we can do, like analytically now solve for g prime of u. You get this. This formula keeps coming up. So there it is once again. It's your favorite formula. It's a over 1 plus af. And what this says is very interesting. It says that the slope of the closed loop characteristic is exactly given by the feedback formula applying the slopes of the, uh, the slope of the open loop characteristic. And what we conclude is the same type of thing. If the loop gain, now defined as, I, this is A prime, 
here, which is the derivative of that characteristic. That's, that's, that takes the place of A. If the loop gain is big, it says that this uh, closed loop uh, derivative or slope is about 1 over F independent of U and so on. So this is, again, interesting. It says that the same thing works, uh, but this is not the point. The point is the reduction in nonlinearity, and that we calculate this way. To, to figure that out, here's what you do. Let's let H be any old fun it's just some function. It's a nonlinear I.O. characteristic. It might, if it, it might be linear, in which case W equals a, a, a number times V or not. And so what we'll do is we'll assume H of 0 is 0, and we'll look at the Taylor series, which looks like this. It's H prime of 0 times V plus 1 half H double prime of 0 times V squared and so on. Now, in the, um, if the system were linear, it would look like that. Okay? That's what the characteristic would look like. Now, all of these other terms here, if you want the system to be linear, all these other terms are sort of like the, their error terms, right? Um, v squared, in fact, they're, what they are called, in fact, is nonlinear distortion terms. That's exactly what these are called, right? So this is the linear, that's the linear term. And everything else in the series is the nonlinear distortion term. Now, if v is small, this first term, and h prime prime of 0 is non-zero, this first term is the one that dominates everything else. In other words, that if v is small, v squared is rather small, right? Because that's, it's small squared. v cubed is rather, rather small, right? Which is small cubed. And it's smaller than something that's rather small, right? Something that's rather, rather small is smaller than something that's merely rather small. Okay. So this basically is that this, for small v, this is actually going to dominate these nonlinear terms is this, this, this one here, OK? Well, one measure of how nonlinear it is is to say, well, how big is that term compared to that term? That's a measure of the nonlinearity, OK? If, for example, this term is 1% of that term, then people will say things like the nonlinearity is on the order of 1%, OK? So that's, uh, that's the type of discussion people would have. If this thing is on the order of 10% of that, that's a different thing. If this is one ten thousandth the size of that, which is in fact not uncharacteristic for, for example, high quality audio or something like that, um, then that means something altogether different. Okay, so but it's the ratio of the two that makes that, that is that is important. And that's given this way. It's H prime prime of zero, that's the curvature of that characteristic at zero, divided by the slope. Actually this is in fact the curvature right here. And then it's multiplied by v. You might ask, well, why is that? Well, it's kind of obvious, right? The linear term grows like v, and the nonlinear term grows like v squared. So that as you raise the size of your input signal, the effect on the linear term you know, kind of goes up. So here's a rule of thumb. You raise your input signal 1 dB, and your, the linear component goes up 1 dB. And the, this second order distortion term goes up by 2 dB, because it's squared, right? So that's why, in fact, you get v in here. OK, so this number, just h prime prime of 0 divided by h prime of 0, gives a measure of the distortion of, of a system. And it's, it, it gives you a good measure when the input signals are small and you know, you're looking at and you're comparing the Taylor series. So the distortion measure for the open loop system is a prime prime of 0 divided by a prime of 0. And if we differentiate this equation again and do a little algebra, you get this, that g prime prime is equal to a, a, prime of v, a prime prime of e divided by 1 plus a prime of e f squared. And what that says is if you divide out by a prime of 0 on each side and all that sort of stuff, here's what you get. You get g double prime of 0 divided by g prime of 0. That's the distort this is the closed loop distortion measure. Is equal to the open loop distortion measure times, once again, it's our friend. It's our friend, the sensitivity. Okay. So, I mean, that's why these things have names, because they just keep coming up over and over and over again. So 1 over 1 plus a prime of 0 times f, which is the sensitivity, is also the amount. It's not just the amount by which the gain is reduced. It's, not just the, it's also the amount by which the sensitivity is reduced. But it's also the amount by which the distortion is reduced. So that's it. So um, you know, basically, everything comes down to the sensitivity, uh, or a lot of things relate to the sensitivity. So in a typical, here would be a typical, I'll give you a typical example right now, is if you take an op amp, it would have a gain of about 100 decibels, just a typical one, maybe 100 decibels. Your closed loop gain would be on the order of 40. 
Okay. For example, that's 100 to 1. It's a gain of 100. You have 60 decibels of feedback, right? So that means the sensitivity, the, the amount of, uh, it says that the sensitivity, S, is about minus 60 dB. What that says is that's a million to 1. What that says is that the, that the op amp circuit you've just designed is, for all practical purposes, it is totally independent of the characteristics of the op amp. Totally, right? Changes in gain of the op amp of rather large amounts, factors of 100, will translate into not even measurable changes in the closed loop gain, okay? That's, that, that's what will happen. The distortion of the original op amp, which by the way can be considered, I mean, well, they have characteristics that look like this picture you just saw. This is, this is what electronic amplifiers, they look like that. This is, this is what they look like. But this distortion is reduced if you have 60 decibels of, of loop gain. This distortion is reduced by a factor of, sorry, six, it, it's, it's reduced by a factor of 1,000. I said a million before, sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, it, it's reduced by a factor of 1,000, okay? So a system which, you know, I promise you if we played some audio through this, with the signal getting out to this level, you would notice it. Actually, it'd be highly intelligible. It just wouldn't sound good. Okay? But anyway, all, you, all it takes is 60 dB of feedback around this thing to make it go from something poorer than telephone quality audio to CD quality. Okay? So all it takes is feedback. Okay? So it's really, this is, it's pretty stunning what, what this does. Okay. Um, and it's critical. I mean, there's absolutely no way anyone could build uh, systems with nonlinearity on the order of, you know, 0.01%, which in fact people routinely build. That's things, if you think about it, that's things accurate that are linear to four digits, right? All the, the analog electronics in a, in a high quality, in, a, in, a, in CD quality audio, it's, it, it's linear to four significant figures. There is no way you could do that without feedback. It's just Im absolutely impossible. Couldn't do it. Couldn't be done. There are no active devices that come even close to that linearity. Okay. So these are simple calculations, but the implications of all this are, are everywhere around you. They're extraordinary. Okay. Um, so let's see. How do you find that closed loop characteristic? I haven't told you. I've plotted a couple of for you. Um, without telling you how we, how, how we did it. And so now, now I'll explain how that's done. So one uh, is, is a graphical method, which is load line. And maybe you did this in 102 or, so, or 101, I mean. I think you did this in 101. Um, so what you do is you write the feedback equations as y equals a of e, e equals u minus f y. And what you do now is you plot, you have a, an e, e y plane, sorry, e, yeah, e y plane, and you plot uh, this and the EY plane, we fix U, we plot that, that's a line, that's this line here. And then we also plot Y equals A of E, that's just this thing. The intersection right here gives you the value of, this is the value of um, E, and therefore that's the value of Y. This is useful because it allows you to understand, actually you can see now visually the reduction in sensitivity and the improvement, actually and the improvement in linearity. Okay, so let's, let's see how that works. For example, here, if you want to know, this is some horrible nonlinearity, right? Horrible nonlinear thing. And we want to know, if I mess with u, if I, as I mess with u, what happens to y? And so let's figure out what happens. All you have to do, visualize, is moving this, this, this thing back and forth and then tracing the projection of the intersection point to the left, to this axis, and that gives you y. Here, if you mess with u back and forth and visualize this, You'll find out, in fact, that the improvement in nonlinearity is not that gr is not so wonderful, right? But what happens is let's let's crank up the feedback, let's make f really big, and the slope of this thing will turn out to look basically flat. It'll be almost flat. So let's imagine the same picture, but with this slope here. Okay. Now let's do the following: grab u and wiggle u back and forth. Okay. When you wiggle u back and forth, right, the intersection point kind of moves along here, right? And you project it over to here, and that gives you the, out, the, the, the output, y. And you see two things instantly. The first thing you see is that the gain is much smaller. In other words, for a big wiggle in u, you get a small wiggle in y. But the other thing you see, and it's immediately clear, is that it's much more linear. 
it's much more linear because as I wiggle this, for all practical purposes, if the intersection is just going to occur down on this part, this is where it's quite linear. It's quite linear here. And so I think visually you can see both. You, you get to see both. So load lines have been used, I guess, since the 20s, basically, and, and still used now, for, uh, just to get a feel for how, what, how this works. Um, let's see. Let me explain how a computer finds uh, a nonlinear transfer characteristic, because, in fact, uh, that's how that's how it would uh, really be done if you're at, well, actually, things are done in two stages. The first stage is, is kind of the, you have, to you have to understand and build the circuit and figure <laughs> out what it's going to do. Um, computers don't do that for you. Um, and then, then you can actually check with all the details. Anyway, so here's how a computer actually solves these equations. Here's some nonlinear equations, y equals a of e equals u, u minus fy. And here's what it does. It simply guesses a value for e. Then what it does is it determines y from that. Then it forms, what it does is it then checks u minus f, y, k. And if this were actually equal to the e you had, you'd be done. Okay? Otherwise, this is sort of an error. So what it does is it replaces the nonlinear equation with the first order Taylor approximation near e, k. That's this. Then it solves the linear equations, which are these, which gives you this formula. It's totally unimportant what it is. And then what it does is it, it, goes back to, uh, it goes back and repeats this. This method, the way it works, I'll show you in a minute the graphical interpretation. But the, this is, for example, how SPICE does it. Okay, if you write down a big circuit and you say, you add the feedback in and you say, show, show me the input-output transfer characteristic of this amplifier, it will do it precisely this way. Okay? And this method, I think you'll see in a minute, you'll get a good guess for it. It actually converges very, very, very quickly. Usually, sometimes it fails completely. Right. So, yeah, here's the way here's the way Newton's method works. Then, um, we're trying to solve for this intersection point. Now, the load line method, your your basic method for solving for the intersection point is your eyeball. So you look at it and you say, "There's the there's the intersection point." Um, so actually, the, the, I mean, and the way a computer does it, if you're doing, it's it's too easy for a computer with one you know one variable here. So it, it the method it's Newton's method here works very happily if you have like 14 E's and 14 Y's and all that kind of stuff, which then your eyeball doesn't work. So what it does is this. Here's your guess of E. Of, of, of e. Actually, it's a terrible guess, as you can see, because the correct E is right there, right? So here's a, it's a, it's a, really, it's a really crappy guess right here. So what it does is it replaces this nonlinearity by the first order Taylor approximation at that point, OK? Then you've got two lines, otherwise known as the solution of linear equations. No problem. It solves the approximation. Now, it would be the correct answer if this characteristic were actually equal to this approximation, but it's not, of course. What you get at then is this point. That's your next D. Okay? At the next iteration, what we do is we go to this curve again, and we calculate a linearized approximation near there. And I think you can see visually that the very next iteration is going to be unbelievably good, right? It's going to be very, very close. And what about the iteration after that? Is going to be v almost dead on. And in fact, that is precisely how Newton's method works. That what it does is once it gets close, it's only two or three iterations, and then it's got it to like nine significant figures. So this is generally how it works. So you'll, uh, you'll encounter this at some point somewhere else, I'm sure. But that's, that's Newton's method. OK. I'm going to mention one more method. In fact, it turns out there's a very simple-minded method. Um, and it's pretty easy. What you do is, basically what you do is you give up on getting an expression for y in terms of u. What you do is you look at this, and you realize that e, you can think of e as a parameter. I guess when we, want, you know, when we plot one function, when we plot it something like this, right? you like to think of, of y as a function of u. The other way to think of this is it's a curve in this plane, parameterized by another parameter. In fact, it's parameterized by E. Because this is, this is an embarrassingly simple observation. But if you look at these two horrible equations, if I say, I, I'll tell you what U is, I'd like to know what Y is, this is a pain in the ass. Because you have to figure out what is the correct E that solves these equations. And this is nonlinear, so this is not easy. On the other hand, what if I said, forget it? What I'll do is, suppose I told you E. Could you find U and Y? Well, 
Of course, it's staring you right in the right in the face here. If I told you e, y is just a of e. If I told you e, u is e plus f y, but that's f a of e. So for every value of e, I can tell you what u and y is. Now you know what I do. I take a whole bunch of values of e. For each value of e, I compute y and I compute u, and I, I plot them on the uy plane. And you know what I'm doing? I'm basically tracing this closed loop curve using as a parameter for the curve, e. And it's, of course, very straightforward. And the truth is, that's how I made the plots I showed you. That's how I did it. I didn't use Newton's method. I just, I mean, Spice would use Newton's method. This, I just, I just did this. I just did the e parameterized method. So that's what I did. And that's, that, that's the idea. And that, that gives it to you. OK, so let's do, a, let's do an example for fun. Here's, a, here's an amplifier, simple amplifier circuit. Um, in fact, the, the, the feedback is not obvious here, not at all, uh, until you start noticing things. Here's the feedback. Um, v out is A of VGS. That's, that's the voltage from the gate to the source. Okay. And that, that voltage is, in fact, um, it's given by, this is a simple model, it is a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a quadratic. Okay. Actually, it's piecewise quadratic, right? And then, and then it, it's actually, then it's zero above that number. So it's actually not even, it's not even given by just a simple formula. It, this, is, this is the formula for the current, the drain current that flows, which is a function of the gate source voltage, VGS. Okay? Now, if there were no resistor down here, that's your feedback, by the way. If there were no resistor, then it'd be easy to solve this because, well, this current is a function of, the, of VGS, which is V in, right? And then once you know this current, you certainly know the output voltage because it's RL times that current. So it's very simple. You add this resistor here, and all of a sudden there's feedback. There's feedback because whenever there's a, whenever there's a voltage V out here, uh, a fraction of that voltage appears here. In fact, precisely, RS over RL times V out appears here. That subtracts from V in to give you VGS. There's your feedback right there. So these are the equations right here, given by this. And the fact is here, I guess with a quadratic, you could use your old quadratic equation and actually analytically solve it. I don't think I, in fact, I didn't. I just used the old lazy method, the E-tracing method. Okay? But in this, this is one of those rare cases where because A is actually quadratic, you could probably solve these stupid <coughs> equations by using your quadratic formula, but what's the point? Anyway, more accurate models of transistors, in more accurate models, this thing is not quadratic. So anyway, this would only work for this simple model. Um, so here are some actual real typical values, pinch off voltage 2 volts, 10 kilo ohms, and a, and a, uh, and a uh, IDSS of, of, of a milliamp. And then what this plot shows is V in and V out, OK? And it shows you for that resistor, which is the feedback, remember, varying. If there's no resistor at all, that's the open, that's the open loop amplifier. As you, you can even visually see, it's quite nonlinear. It is quite nonlinear, right? It's, I mean, it's clear to the eye. Now, if you pick a point on here and only vary a few millivolts, you're fine. Of course, actually, that's a lie for, for example, high quality audio or anything else. That'd be, because, you know, what looks good I mean, you're sensitive to stuff at the, at the third digit. Nonlinearity in the third digit, you will hear. Okay? Certainly in the second digit, you'll hear. Um, but on the other hand, it's obviously highly nonlinear. This is, as you increase the feedback, these are the curves you get. And this goes all the way up to 5 kilo ohms. And, and what the curves show, once again, is precisely what you know that is going to happen. As you increase the feedback, the gain goes down. In fact, that's the slope of these curves. Okay? But not only that, they become more linear. Now, this one at 5 kilo ohms is still not that, you know, it's still got, it's, it's still a bit nonlinear over here, but it's substantially more linear than that. Okay? So for here, for example, if the voltage were to range in this range, this would, be, this would probably be quite listenable. This would be almost unlistenable. Okay? So you see everything here. You also see all sorts of other stuff here, like, for example, in this transistor, suppose that one of these parameters, like the pinch-off voltage, for example, were to change with, as a function of temperature. If I, were to plot, if I were to plot a new plot that showed the same characteristic, but at plus, I don't know, plus 35 degrees centigrade, plus 40, what would you see here? How would the new plot, how would the, how would the new open loop plot look? 
if the pinch-off voltage changed, for example, substantially as a function of temperature, which is quite typical, what would happen? What would happen for if I plotted this one? Here's what would happen. This one, because the pinch-off voltage has changed, the whole thing would change. This thing would change at a, at a different temperature. You know, I don't know what it would look like. If I knew anything about actually devices, I could tell you what it would do. But it might, it might look substantially different. So in other words, this says that's room temperature. That's at, you know, that's at plus 40 C. Okay? It would look like that. How about this one? What would it look like as you vary the temperature over 100 degrees centigrade range here? What would it look like? Just a guess. You have a substantial, you have a reasonable amount of feedback. What does it do? Yeah. You know what it would look like? It would look exactly like that. It wouldn't change in the slightest. In other words, the sensitivity to changes in, in the open loop characteristic are also divided by the, by the amount of loop gain you have. And so what would happen is this curve, that's the curve at probably minus 50 C, plus 50 C. That's what the curve looks like. This one could go nuts, could vary all over the place. OK, so a summary of this lecture is, is this. Um, you, using feedback, you can trade raw gain for lower sensitivity and greater linearity. And that's, that this is the way it's used in 99% of all cases. Um, and the benefits, the, the benefits you get from feedback seem, they, they all come down, curiously enough, to one simple parameter, and that is the sensitivity, which is 1 over 1 plus AF, okay? Now, in fact, people even, since, a, since when, when people use feedback, the amount of feedback is usually substantial. In other words, S is usually 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 5. Um, then this is even approximated as 1 over AF. That's the loop gain if AF is large. So what basically, what roughly, roughly speaking, the way people would describe this is people, someone would look at a circuit and say, well, how, you know, how nonlinear is it? How, how, uh, how much, just, uh, you know, how sensitive is it to variations in temperature? And then someone would say, oh, pretty. And then they'd say, well, you better wrap about 30 decimals of feedback around that. And then you know you're going to reduce your gain by 30 decibels, but you're going to improve your sensitivity by a factor of its 30 decibels by a factor of 30. That's an accident because 30 decibels, I think, is around, around th it happens to be also 30 about. Um, and also you're going to reduce your distortion by a factor of 30. So these are the, these are the typical things. Now, I, I mentioned a couple of times, I'll mention it one more time. In a very small number of applications, all of this, all of this, does not, uh, can be applied in the reverse direction. In other words, you can use feedback where the sensitivity, instead of being a small number like 10 to the minus 2, or 10 to the minus 1, or 10 to the minus 5, you can actually do it where S is 10. And that means that AF, your loop gain, is around minus 1. When you do that, it's very, you get the opposite on the trade-off. What, what happens then is your gain is a lot higher. You've, you've boosted the gain of the, of the system. That's great. In fact, it's spectacular if you, get, if, you just, if you get more gain out of something than you thought you could. And it's, it's kind of obvious intuitively how that happens. You have a feedback thing, so you're kind of recirculating the signal all around, and it gets boosted every time. Um, now, what do you pay for it? What you pay for it is you get a system now which is not less sensitive to its components, but in fact much more sensitive to the components. And also, what do you think happens to the distortion now when you use positive feedback, if, if you want to call this positive feedback? What, happens, what do you think happens to the nonlinearity and distortion? It's way up. It's amplified now. So again, I mention this only because in 99.99% of all actual cases, feedback is used to do, to do this. But in a handful of cases, it's used to do the opposite, which is to actually increase sensitivity, increase the distortion. That's the bad news. And the good news is it increases the gain. So the trade-off works both, both directions. Um, OK, so what, what we'll do is actually I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about um, the, uh, our next topic, which is um, feedback control systems. So that's, that's, our, that's going to be our next topic. And then um, I will, I'll continue this uh, on Monday. Although I'll jump ahead. Well, I'll actually kind of continue it this afternoon or something. But <clears throat> anyway. Um, we're going to stick with static analysis, but we're going to look at um, 
feedback, I should say that what we've just looked at is feedback from the pure EE or electronics point of view. Um, a, as I mentioned a couple of times, feedback is widely used not just in that, in that, in electronics, where it's a completely enabling technology. I think that should be obvious, right? Uh, it's also used, it's the basis of, of whole other fields and areas. So I'll, I'll actually say a little bit about that, but one, one of these areas is something called feedback control systems, and we'll, we'll just sort of talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, uh, we'll do that on Monday, really. Um, so the basic idea in um, something called automatic control um, is this. You have, you have something like a, a plant or a system. Plant is the traditional name. Um, and you have some measuring devices on it, like uh, they're called sensors traditionally. And you have some devices on it that can actually affect its behavior. That's traditionally called an actuator. Now you also have disturbances acting on this, this thing. Um, and an automatic control system is a little smart processor or smart box which listens to the sensor signals, listens to the command, some command signals that come in, figures out what's the right thing to do, and ships that over to the plant. If you want a simple, simple and, and good picture for what this is, you can take one simple example is you take an aircraft, um, at, say, air, aircraft roll control system. What that does is you have your aircraft flying like this. You have gyroscopes that will tell you whether you're tilting one way or another. Okay? Um, what's your actuator, by the way, for roll? What's your, what is it? Well, I, not, it's, yeah, they are flaps. It's control surfaces. They're ailerons, right? Which are these little things that have one on either side of the wing. And they actually go in opposite directions, right? Because if they, the ones that go like this are the elevators. The, one, the ones that actually go opposite are, are ailerons. So if you tip up like this, what happens is you put a torque on the whole thing like that, right? And if you, if you tip like that, you put a torque uh, this way, right? So th these are the ailerons. So for example, for a roll control system, your plant is actually the, it's the airplane. Um, your sensor might be a, uh, a, a, well, it could be a little GPS thing. They actually don't use that yet because they're totally backward. Um, but it could be, uh, for example, a gyroscope signal, something like that. And then your actuator signal are your ailerons. And the disturbances are all sorts of things. There could be a little pocket of air of slightly different density that hits the right wing. And the result is that the, it puts a small bump on the airplane that starts tilting. Or it could be this. Someone gets up from one side of the airplane and walks to the other, just across the aisle. Okay. Well, what happens? Well, you know from physics exactly what happens. You take, the, you take the center axis of the airplane, and you have a mass on one side. You go to the other, and they put it, you're putting a very small torque on the airplane. And so, in fact, if there were no automatic control system, when someone moves from one, aisle, from one side of the, one window to the other, the whole airplane, slowly, sure, but it will actually start rolling like that. Absolute, there's just absolutely no doubt about it. There's nothing to keep it from rolling. Okay. Um, so anyway, what happens then is that the gyroscope reports, in fact, that the airplane is rolling. It reports it and figures out the appropriate thing to do with the ailerons. And the, the obvious thing is when a person moves from that side to that side is you have to put a, a, an opposite torque that cancels the torque generated by the person moving from one, one seat to the other, from one window to the other. Okay. These are very small because a person doesn't weigh a whole lot and they're only moving eight feet from one side to the other. So the amount of torque, relatively speaking, is, is pretty small. And the ailerons are way out there. And just a little tip is going to generate a very substantial torque. So, but it is a fact that those, those ailerons, when you move across the aisle, I guarantee you, when you move, the ailerons will change. And they're changing because of you. They'll change a very small amount, like a fraction of a degree. But they'll move. And if they didn't, the whole thing would go up and down. So anyway, you know what we'll do is we'll, we'll quit here. But the next thing we're going to talk about is this, um, is this, is the signal processing that goes in this little box. And we'll, uh, so have fun with your quiz, and I'll, I'll see some of you who are curious about seeing lectures out of order at, at 3 o'clock.